Looking back at Me and My Shadows, the album, Cliff, I noticed that of the 14, sorry, 16 tracks on the album, there's only one that was a single, that was Gee Wiz, It's You, and even that was a bit of a mistake. Yeah. In, in fact, um, I suppose in those days we were never really aware of albums as such. We were always looking for singles, but in this case, and so therefore the album was a separate project. It just so happens that Europe happened to get Gee Wiz, It's You and like it and whipped it off and turned it into a single. And I don't think it was ever actually officially, officially released here. Someone told me it was like one of those things where, you know, they have a, a foreign number and you can therefore get it from your store and order it. They can order it. But it's never actually, I don't think, been written down as a release in Britain. But, you know, those sort of things have happened to other people too, I guess. And it's slightly confusing sometimes because no one knows who's selling what. So when you went in to record an album back in those days, and we're talking about 1960 in the case of Me and My Shadows, would you say, right, we've got three days in which to come up with 16 songs that will work on LP? Or was it something that you would build up, as you would today, over a period of time until you... Somebody said, hey, Cliff, there are 16 tracks, let's stick them out. We tended to, um, uh, Norrie Paramore, the late Norrie Paramore, who produced what, the first 15 years of my records for me, uh, he and I would meet regularly and go through piles and piles of songs. We'd have a yes pile and a no pile and a maybe pile. And we would, before we went into the studios to start any album, like all of these songs on, uh, on the Me and My Shadows album, we'd already have chosen the songs. We'd have already said, this is going to work, we'll do it this way. And if, if they needed arrangements, Norrie would have planned uh, an arranger for the session. Um, and in, mo in the case of Me and My Shadows, of course, it was strictly The Shadows and I. And so therefore, once we'd chosen the songs, The Shadows and I would just meet up and, and just rehearse it through. We didn't tend to rehearse in the studio, so I know that nowadays bands go in and they almost write, rehearse and record, which is the reason why albums take so long to to put it put together but um, in those days we'd meet at someone's house I guess and uh, I can't remember exactly where but we'd rehearse the stuff go into the studio and be prepared to record it uh, there and then but no we'd, we'd have all the songs ready made out and do you remember me and my shadows was that done on two track or four track that would have been done on a, it was strictly stereo I mean, you see, they always say that the Beatles did wonders with four tracks well I mean they don't know what it was like to record mono we started recording mono and so stereo, we had stereo. When we did, we never did overdubs on those two tracks. Uh, we uh, superimposed. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous. And I think the first time we ever superimposed uh, on, onto anything was uh, a single of mine called Lucky Lips, where we sort of meted up the, the backing vocal bit. But um, So we had to deal with the first five years of my career anyway with recording mono or just two track. And you would sing live with the backing, whether it was the Shadows or an orchestra. Yes, and that was the problem, of course, and that's why we probably got good at doing live things, because um, we had to get it right. In the end, we all had to get it as right as possible, or, or else you'd you know, have to take 82, because Cliff got the ending wrong, you know, and it's so frustrating to, you, everyone plays it really well, and you, you blow the lyric on the last line, and everyone's got to do the whole thing again. So we had to go through that, which is probably why the Shads and I got, got off at such a good start when we came to do our live gigs, because we were used to getting things right, uh, you know, first time. Because, in fact, one of your albums that preceded Me and My Shadows, that was done as live in the studio, wasn't it? You actually got a gang of fans in and recorded it in this very studio. In the studio we're recording in now, yes. It was Studio 2 downstairs, in fact, here at Abbey Road. It's, it's a studio that I discovered later was a battleground, really, for many of us who wanted that particular studio. I started my career there. I had my first ever photograph, my first ever publicity picture taken in the as you look down from the the, the uh, engineer's room, far left-hand corner, my little picture was taken there. And I, re I realized later, I didn't realize, I understood later from meeting Paul McCartney, that when, for instance, the Beatles started, they wanted to record in that studio. And I always said, yeah, but it was really unfair, because every time we rang up, they said, sorry, the Beatles have got it. And Paul said, no, no, every time we rang up, they said, you and the Shadows had got it. So we had this great confrontation going on that we never really knew about till years afterwards. So who was in there? I don't know. <laughs> there were lots of other people that worked in there, of course, but we, I guess we had the, the pleasure of being one of the first rock artists for EMI to, to actually come out of that studio and enjoy that studio. And, of course, the Beatles found great, great uh, inspiration there. And there's something... It's not exact, I'm the, I've never been a superstitious person, but for years I didn't want to record anywhere else. Nowadays, you know, Tim, it's, it's, fu it's funny, but I don't care where I record. Because in the end, you know, when you get your mouth four inches from the microphone and it goes down through into the desk and comes back through the cans that you're wearing. You could be anywhere in the world. You could be outside. It wouldn't matter. And so uh, I have no great uh, fears of studios anymore and record all over the place. There are plenty of hits today that are done in 
bedrooms in bedsits and things by technical wizards, often only age 17 or 18. Have you ever thought of making an album from your bedroom at home? <laughs> Sometimes I must say, the, one I, the way I feel when I wake up some days, I think it would be good to phone in your work. Yes. But uh, no, I, funnily enough, I've never been um, a sort of, I'm not a very me- mechanical, technical sort of person. I, I, I mean, my car just gets me from A to B, and if it goes wrong, I have to stop and get out and get someone to mend it. And I realise now, working with a lot of young musicians, I have a co-producer at the moment who's a keyboard player for me, a guy called Paul Mosel. And uh, people like him, his ilk, he's 25. Well, they live and breathe computers. When we go into the studio, okay, I may make a suggestion as to us of how a thing should go and how it might sound. He just types in all sorts of things and out come all this, this stuff comes up on the screen and then sounds come out of the speakers. And I think to myself, I have no idea how this works. I just know it does, like my car. I just t- I just switch it on and say press go. So it's a very far cry from 1960 when you were doing the Shadows, oh, it's me, a, me and my Shadows album. But it, in those days, did you feel that what you were doing with electric guitars and tremolo arms and speakers, did you feel that you were in the forefront of some sort of musical revolution, or were you just making do with what you'd got? We were making do with what we had, really. I I, I suppose I think the reason why we perhaps didn't feel like great innovators, not at the time, was because we were so influenced by the Americans. In other words, it was me and my shadows that really created, I feel, the beginnings of European pop rock music, music that wasn't coming immediately out of the States. Because, uh, I mean, the shadows and I were influenced by Jerry Lee Lewis and the Everly Brothers and Elvis and Ricky Nelson, Buddy Holly. I mean, all these truly great rock legends. So when we started doing our thing, we, we tended to be influenced by them. So you never felt that you were actually leading the way anyway. But when we came to do Me and My Shadows, it's the first time that we kind of sat around together and, and, and got a thing going and got a sound going that wasn't strictly American, although it was, it, was in, it was, you know, leaning in that direction. In other words, we were leaning away from the British idea of what rock and roll was. Until that time, and I hope Tommy Steele will forgive me for saying this, we, our rock and roll was rock with the caveman, yo, 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 you know? Yes. And so there was something a little cute about it you know a little uh, it just wasn't aggressive and and funky enough i guess and although our album me and my shadows is far from funky it you could see the beginnings of of what was going to be something that was going to revolutionize music again how did you feel then when all these groups led by the beatles came up in 62 3 4 and amazingly mm-hmm. you and the shadows retained your popularity and an awful lot of people said well that's it for all the old old generation as you already were <laughs> Um, but did you did you feel threatened, or I mean, oh, it must yes. have been moments when you thought, "That's it, I've had five years." Yes, I mean, I, I well, I didn't think about it in terms of five years, but we were all threatened uh, because we were the blast in '58, '59, '60, right through to '62, '63, as it went to the Beatles. There was nobody around that really was. Uh, uh, I mean, the Shadows and I had it all to ourselves, really. I mean, there were other great artists, of course. There was Marty Wilde and Billy Fury and people like that, terrific. But but we were all on a par, and we were perhaps. A neck ahead. Yes. Whereas when the Beatles came, <clears throat> everybody was knocked off the front pages. And you know, there's a period of about two years when you'd think, if you looked at the press cuttings, that no one else did anything for two years. But the truth of the, f- the matter is that um, the Shadows and I were still touring. We were still selling out. We had, uh, I mean, when you look at my chart success, I've got, um, I think it's three hits every year for 33 years. So things didn't actually stop. But the emphasis, media-wise, the attention was all on the Beatles and the whole new, the Liverpool sound and stuff like that. So, of course, we were worried. Of course, we were threatened. But it's only with, you know, it's, with hindsight, it's easy to look back and say, well, it's obvious that we weren't going to get crumbled. But at the, but at the time, we felt we were going to get truly crushed. And, uh, and I guess it's because... What, History will show that we played a part in even the Beatles being. Absolutely. And so that's why probably we can't get crushed. It's the same. Shakespeare will never be pushed out of the way. Other things may come along as good and be as attractive to the public and even sometimes appear to be more attractive, but Shakespeare will always be there. And I think those of us who began have got that niche that's ours forever. And so uh, in that respect, it makes, makes life a little easier because you, then you're not, you're not worried about being pushed out by anybody. Whereas uh, there's always been aggression in terms of uh, competition in our rock and roll world. And, and, uh, and it's always there. It's still there today. You know, I still have to face, because I still compete, because I'm still in the charts, I still have to face the fact that just when you think the Beatles have forgotten, Michael Jackson comes along. <laughs> and you think, oh, no, here we go again. You know, the world talks about another great star who is a great star. Yes. And he's taking the music on and performing into another 
uh, into another e era. But certainly, you are perhaps one of the few artists who now can truthfully say, I don't really need the charts. I mean, if you never had another hit, you would be unlikely to lose your following. I suppose that's true. I, I find it hard to relate to it because I've never, ever lost my love for recording. I think it also gives you a very good um, test. It's, it's unusual for an artist to... In fact, it's absolutely unique for an artist to go on having chart hits with such regularity for such a long time in Great Britain. And I would guess, looking at it from the outside, that maybe it, it keeps you up to the mark in a funny way. You think... Yes. Every three or four months, I've got to find a couple of good songs to record. That's right. Well, that's always uppermost in my mind. When we're thinking about an album, you're thinking, OK, the album, the danger about an album is that you can indulge a little, uh, or rather a lot. But uh, if you're really careful, you can indulge, but still have, you can still maintain that thing with the public, which is give them something that they just can listen to fairly easily on the radio which attracts them to the album, which then gives you a chance to present them with stuff that maybe is not playable to a DJ's ears, but who your fans are going to like after three hearings. Uh, but I've always kept uh, very much in the forefront of my mind the fact that artists like myself rely very heavily, if we want to stay contemporary, if we want to stay really up front and competing, you've got to have the material that is single, is, you know, that a DJ can't argue with, because DJs have a right to choose what they want. I sometimes feel that they're influenced almost too much by what they think people want. Whereas people like myself, for instance, I mean, I know this sounds ridiculous, but in a way, people like myself, the Stones, Elton John, we defy all of that, really, because we've already proven ourselves over the years that there is a public. I mean, I can go touring around the world. I can tour uh, Europe, Australia, the Far East, and, and we're always sold out. Our concerts are sold out, which means there's a public there. So what DJs have to say is, well, Cliff Richard's got a new single out. I better play it because there are people out there that like him. You know, it's not, I don't have to prove it. They don't have to prove it. But having said that, I will say that it's still not easy to get your record played. So you have to think in terms of what is it that's going to sound good to the public, but also make it possible for a DJ to play your record with no bias. And where do you find the songs? Because, well, they will come on to it later. You're not principally a writer. You, 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 you haven't written very much of your material over the years. So where do the songs come from? Or... Perhaps they come from everywhere, but how do you choose them? Well, they do come from everywhere. Um, I've, some people think, oh, you've got a writer because I've had uh, some success, for instance, a lot of success with Alan Tarney. In the early days, I had a lot of su success with Bruce Welsh and Hank Marvin's writing, the writing of The Shadows, Brian Bennett and people. And everyone said, of course, well, they write for Cliff. But even during those days, I had other singles written by other people. And because I'm not primarily a writer, I'm a performer who sings or a singer who performs, I don't know which way around. I should have said that. <laughs> but, um, but it means that I've been wide open to anybody who writes but doesn't have an outlet. Because nowadays, of course, a lot of people write, well, most people write and record their own thing. Now, that's okay if you happen to be a songwriter, but I, I tend to think that I still favor my, uh, my sure. career because I don't have the hang-up of ever going dry. But it's amazing how many acts of today, groups who've been around for four or five years have their biggest hits with other people's songs. Yes. People like Deacon Blue, when they recorded a Burt Baccarat record, they had a number two hit. Yes, that's right. Their own stuff was never quite as big. Even a very talented outfit like Simply Red, when they recorded other people's songs, or Jimmy Somerville. These so acts, they all do... These are acts who write, but not. they don't write quite as magnificently all the time. No, well, that's... that's and it proves the value of a great song. I think so. I think if there was... A, if, I was if I was a writer... I would temper what I did with uh, at least 50% of what other people do. In other words, you know, again, it depends on one's ego, I suppose. Some people have an ego that is sure. fired by writing and performing your own things all the time. And I use the term ego not in a, a, a you know, critical manner. We've all got ego, we all of us that perform. But um, I don't have that particular, that, my ego is calmed in that area. If I was a writer, I would, I would record never more than 50% of my own things. Because it's like, for instance, I had already written three or four songs. I've written a, a number of songs over the years, and I've I just like them enough to to record them for B sides and uh, and in fact on this the CD package here there's, there's a whole bunch of my stuff. But they were written over 33 years. Now how can I choose to record one of those as a single when Alan Tarney comes up with We Don't Talk Anymore and says Would you like to record this? Yes, exactly. My mind said ding, and I thought <laughs> How can I possibly say I'll record one of mine when a Alan is giving me what actually has turned out to be one of his biggest hits too. Yeah. So, you know, I have no uh, feelings in that area other than to say I want to make as many hit singles as possible. And, uh, it, and those singles are the, are the reason why my albums sell. 
And on the albums, you can afford to do things that maybe are a little bit more left and right of centre. I think it's true that even the greatest writers like Elton John benefit from doing the odd song by other people. And I think it's a great credit to people like Elton that he often does that. He's a fan as well as a great creator. I think often people who only write their own stuff are in great danger of, of not seeing the wood for the trees. I think so. And it must improve even Elton's writing, which is superb. The fact that he does do other people's material, material yes. must help him. I'm sure so. I mean, it widens your own horizon. And also, I think, for from the writer's point of view, it must... Uh, influence your own writing, which sure. is very important to have influences that continue to change and progress. Well, we have uh, a CD now of songs written and co-written by you, or written or co-written by you, and to be quite honest, even though I've followed your career with great enthusiasm and in great detail for 33 years, I was <laughs> quite surprised to see that there were now easily enough songs to go onto a long CD well, do you know there's more of Cliff in? Richard I'm songs, really? my ego. No, I, I've actually, even I wrote, more. My well, goodness. we had to cut it down. We couldn't get them all on there, you see. But but remember, they were written over a long, long period of time. <laughs> but the 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 two biggest ones, of course, are Bachelor Boy and Don't Talk to Him, yes. which were both written with Bruce. What was the split between you and Bruce on that? Not financially, oh, but, but creatively. We were well. Bruce wrote most of. Uh, uh, Bachelor Boy was uh, was his musical thing. I I did lyrical content. And Don't Talk to Him, I did lyrics on that too. So I was a lyricist on both those occasions. I see there are several tracks from an album of yours called 31st of February Street, mm. um, which I remember particularly for a reworking of Travelling Light that you did. Oh, yes. But on that, um, there are songs like Fireside Song and Nothing to Remind Me and There You Go Again, which you wrote. Was that album, which, to be frank, wasn't an enormous success, no. um, was, it, was, it, was it something that, that was a great personal Yes. statement for you for me I think again looking back at, at it from with hindsight I see it as being the transition album uh, before that I'd got very heavily into acting and I wanted to be an actor and did a couple of plays in, in repertory and things And but my musical career was just sort of sliding along nicely I was having these three hits a year but I wasn't that interested in them I used to turn up and put my voice onto a track basically when I started working uh, with a guy called Dave McRae uh, Dave Mackay sorry um I have better apologise about that because he's Australian. In case anybody <laughs> in Australia has listened to this, Dave Mackay uh, was producing this album for me and I got interested in the production and he he encouraged me to write. And uh, so I played him a couple of things I'd got. And he said, oh, fabulous, and got arrangements done. And so I ended up writing, I think there were four tracks on that, that album, but it was a transitional album. I don't think it got any amount of, uh, well, there was no sort of real single from it. Um, nothing to remind me, to, I think, is one of the best songs I've ever written. But, you know, again, what we think is best as artists isn't necessarily the most commercial. So, uh, Do you do write, um, you know, to suit your voice, or do you write something because you feel that that's what you want to say? Um, or a bit of both? A bit of both, I suppose. I mean, whenever I've ever written anything, the times I've written my best stuff were it was always been under pressure. It's... Um, for instance, when I've worked with an organization called Tear Fund, it's a charitable organization, and they've often invited me to be part of a movie. You know, they take a film of their work in Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And I, I go along there, and they said, it'd be nice if we had a couple of songs. And I think, I've got two weeks, I'm here. And I, and I used the moments there to inspire me, whether it be about the children in need or... Uh, in fact, one of my favorite ones... It's a song called Lagunave, which I believe is on this CD. It is, yes. And it was, I didn't have my guitar. It was packed away. In fact, we were on this tiny boat, only about 20 feet long, the boat, and there were about 10 people on it, and our baggage was on it. My guitar was underneath all the baggage and the tarpaulin thrown over the top because water sprays in on these journeys across from mainland ha ha Haiti to this little tiny island of Lagunave. And I had taken two seasick pills because I can't bear going up and down in that manner, and I wasn't seasick. And I was leaning against the mast, and the engine was going... Gong, gong, and, it, and I thought, I found out afterwards it was E minor. <laughs> but I wrote the song about Laganov having not actually reached it. So I was giving my impression of the island before I got there. And it did loom out of the mists. And I find that, the, my, that I, to me, that's one of my best songs. Um, because the, the moment inspired me. But also I had in my mind, they want a song. They need a song of me. Their expectation of me, the pop singer, was that I would be able to do it. And so therefore, a couple of times I've written under that kind of pressure. And I've found that the, those songs have been the fastest ones I've written. And uh, in the case of Laganav, I think the best one I've ever written. 
Lindsay Jane and Lindsay Jane Two mm. are two songs which are on this CD. Who is Lindsay Jane? Well, funnily enough, of course, the, the story, the, the songs are not actually about a person, although the, the the name of the boat, Lindsay Jane, was inspired by the daughter of a friend of mine. I think she goes around telling everyone, of course, that I wrote about her, <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Jane. But uh, but it's the boat, and it's the first time I'd had a holiday on a boat, and we were in the Mediterranean, and well, you know what boats are like. I mean, there are certain things that have a a romance about them, and boats is definitely one of them. I mean, we actually we actually gunned the boat down you know we really made it go fast at night so that the Mediterranean was absolutely pitch black oil and just moonlight and this spray that went 12 feet each side of the boat it was just mystical almost and so I, I and one afternoon sitting around trying to keep out of the sun because it was so hot I started strumming and oh, naturally that those moments you know were in my mind and so therefore it, 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 Lindsay Jane came along. Now, we mentioned Alan Tarney, hmm. and we mentioned David Mackay, and they have Australia in common. And, of course, you've worked with people like Olivia Newton-John. I mean, do you have a particular affinity for Australia and Australians, or is it just coincidence that so many of your collaborators have come from down under? Well, it can't be a coincidence, can it? I, I, I guess we were, when I say we, my manager, Peter Gormley, my then manager, Peter Gormley, was from Australia. And uh, therefore, there was a natural connection with Australia. But... I started using musicians long before they became popular in other parts of the world because Australia, it was you know almost painfully obvious that people like Tani and Terry were going to come through strong and big. Terry Britton, that is. Terry Britton, yes. sorry, yes. And uh, but I feel it a privilege now when I look back again, looking back, you know, with the histrionics of it all. There I was working with people who turned out right. Terry Britton, who wrote Tina Turner's massive number one of What's Love Got to Do with with it, which I always feel he should have sent to me first. He just <laughs> didn't do that, that one. Um, Alan Tarney writing We Don't Talk Anymore. And there they were, in my band, as guitarist and bass player, together. So, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to feel sometimes that you recognise that something's happening somewhere else, and we recognise that it was happening in Australia. And I worked with Kevin Peake, also from Australia. A guy called Trevor Spencer played drums on, uh, on a number of my records. And so uh, the connection was always there. And Peter Gormley has to be the one that's credited with the discovery, really, of Olivia Newton-John. And he had faith in her, got John Farrer, another Australian, to, to produce her, who then wrote many of her big hits in the States, but originally produced her with uh, the Dylan song, If Not For You. And I was the first one to present her on stage and on television. That's right, because you had that series in Britain in the early 70s. That's right. Or late 60s, which... I think she was on every week, wasn't she, as a guest star? Or? Eight, eight of the 13. She, start, she was only going to sing her record. Right. But it works so well. She looks always so wonderful. The camera seemed to just love her. And then I invited her back, and then I thought, well, this is fantastic, to be able to sing a duet almost weekly with someone who looks good and sings well was a great treat for me and, of course, a great push for our show. So although I feel we helped Olivia, there's no doubt that her presence in our show boosted um, my profile, certainly, in this country. So, uh, and then she took off in the States, of course, and then I lost contact to a great extent. Of, you know, we, d we just didn't meet up. But uh, we still talk on the phone, of course, and we're still friends. But, uh, but you had a hit with her in the States, didn't you, on record? Yes, yeah, she made a movie which was not that well-received. And, not, and uh, she'll forgive me, I know, it was not a brilliant movie called... Um, Sanadu. Sanadu, yes. But it did have a good score. It had some good hit records in it. Uh, and suddenly, it was uh, apparently her co-star couldn't or didn't sing. Probably could sing. Most people say they can't sing, but in fact they can. But obviously he's not a singer. And then John Farrow rang me up and said, look, we've got this wonderful ballad, uh, and we'd like you to sing it. So I went across there. And, you know, earlier talking about people recording in their bedrooms, we recorded that in a garage. Uh, John's engineer works in it from a garage, and we just had to stop every now and then if a car went by. <laughs> <laughs> or a lorry, rather. You didn't yes. hear the car so much, but you could hear lorries going by. But uh, that was recorded uh, in, in somebody's garage. But that was a great treat, and I loved the song. It's a fantastic song. It wasn't as big a hit as the other ones, but then it was the fifth single from the album, and the album had already been... Had, I don't know whether the album had number one, but it was always into, already into multi-million. The Xanadu album. Yeah. Yes, it was very big. And, of course, the single, Xanadu itself, was a number one. Yes, that's right. Now, Hank Marvin, of course, is a final connection with Australia for you because Hank has now gone to live in, in Perth, I understand. He has, yes. Well, I mean, I guess um, it's almost inevitable that, uh, that people that visit Australia, uh, Europeans that visit Australia, love it a great deal, particularly for the, from the point of view of, of the Britain, because you go to a foreign land where they all speak English and there's sunlight. 
Yes. And so therefore, and Hank, I know, was very was desperate to take his family and give them uh, an open air life, and and that's what he does. He's wonderful. Uh, he'd only been in his home for about a month when I visited for the first time, and he said. I spent the day there with him, and uh, he said, oh, quick, uh, he said, Carol, uh, you get lunch ready. I'll just drive Cliff out for a minute. And we went off and visited three wineries. <laughs> and it was so funny because we'd arrive, and Hank would lean on this, and Fred behind the bar, they have these little kind of bars down in the cellar, and, and these little tiny glasses would be poured out with tiny dribbles of wine, and Hank would sip a bit and say, oh, Fred, he said, yeah, I'll have two bottles of that, and three perhaps of that white I like last. And he'd fallen into the lifestyle yeah. very easily, and, and everyone was on first... Uh, name terms, which is not surprising to me because Hank has always been a very open, open character and has obviously uh, fallen into the way of life very, very simply and easily and just loves it out there. I think it's going to be hard to get him away from it now. Did you find it difficult, going back to the Days of the Shadows, to make the transformation from, I mean, getting rid of the shadows in a way? I mean, I know it wasn't like that, but, but, but did, you, did you feel perhaps I should stay with them forever or was it just a natural thing? Did you... It was a natural thing. I would uh, initially have said, if you'd asked me five years after we got started, I would say, oh, yeah, I don't want to record with anybody else because we were the best at what we were doing. And um, it was just that there were internal problems with the shadows. There were always internal conflicts in the shadows, and that's why they were very early changes. I mean, when you think that Jet Harris, the original bass player, and Tony Meehan, the second drummer, because Terry Britton, Terry Britton, Terry Smart, my School friend played drums originally with the original Drifters, but uh, Tony came in very quickly. I think neither Tony or Jet got past two years. Only the first two years of our lives together was with that particular lineup. From then onwards, uh, Brian Bennett took over, and then we had a succession of bass players. But within the band, there were always conflicts. And I guess it's when you've got people who are creative individually, trying to stick it together. The Beatles couldn't last more than ten years, could they? Or was it was it ten years? I don't think it was. It was about. Eight, nine eight, years at that's their right. peak, yes. Because there are these tensions and these pulls where people want to express themselves separately and differently. And and that's what was kind of happening with the shadows. We see it even with the Everly Brothers, and there's only two of them, but, and, well, and they're brothers. And that's right. They've yeah. had problems over the years. That, that's right. It took a long yeah. time for them to re recognize that they were loved together, as um, perhaps more so than separately. Yes. In fact, almost certainly more so than separately. But um, that's what was going on. You see, again, Norrie Paramore, I always give no great credit to Norrie because... Again, only looking back, I can say, I don't know whether he planned it or not, but maybe he thought that this can't go on forever the way it is. So very early in my career, I was recording with orchestras. A, a number of my early albums were 16-tracked albums, eight aside, and one side, or four aside, would be with Nori Paramore strings. The other four would be with the combo, the shadows. Same on the, the flip side. And so Nori had got me into recording without the shadows quite a long time before we actually finally decided there is no more there are no more shadows they've broken up so I had to go on my own and by that time of course it wasn't so strange to arrive in a studio and, and record without them and of course the shadows recorded under Norrie's baton oh yes without you oh, that, and, well, and at one point we're doing just as well as you on the charts well they I mean Apache was number one they had wonderful life at number one for I don't know 10 weeks or something silly in those days we were number one for a long time yes. nowadays we come and go so fast but <laughs> uh, they yeah they, th this was the strength I feel that we had here we had uh, you know, we always used to break it down and say, well, of course, what, what happens is that most of the girls, of course, come to see Cliff and all the boys come to see Hank. So that way we were always sold out. Who came to see Bruce? Uh, not many people <laughs> came mom. to see Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> Bruce's aunt, who's still convinced that he can sing better than me. I mean, she's got no taste, that woman. <laughs> <laughs> but I gather you're doing some more work with Bruce, who's been one of your most successful producers yeah. since you left Norrie, or rather since... Well, he, uh, he produced, I mean, uh, without a doubt, the biggest selling single I've ever had, We Don't Talk Anymore. And, you know, he's, a, he's a, a really good producer. I've always enjoyed working with different producers. Again, I have no feelings. I've, in fact, I think I was way ahead of my time. I was talked out of the idea some, I don't know, 15 years ago when I wanted to work with multiple producers. I thought, why can't an album have... If I'm singing all these different types of songs, if my album is filled with all ballads, country songs, country rock, heavier rock stuff, why can't I have different producers? And I was talked out of that because they said people said to me, well, it's just not done, you know. And of course, nowadays it's done all the time. But I've enjoyed working with different producers because they demand different things from you as an artist. I've worked with... Uh, Bruce, for instance, is a, an intricate little devil to work with because he wants always you to be precisely in tune. I would guarantee... I'd be, I would almost stake my life on the, on the fact that the albums that Bruce and I have recorded together, if you went back to the masters and dissected each track and listened to each track... Whether it be vocal or instrumental, you will not find a bum note, not one. 
Because, I mean, I've been in this very studio here when Bruce has sent home the musicians because they're out of tune, because he's got sick and tired of hearing about tune. And, and they've, to, to his mind, or to his ears, not been in tune. And he says, oh, well, go back when you're in t- come back when you're in tune. Has he now, ever sent you home? No, he hasn't quite done that, but I'll tell you what he's done. He's slightly more subtle with me, because he's, he's a very, very funny man. He's, a, he's, got, he's probably the king oh, of the one-liners. He's a very funny man. Well, I mean, I've sung. He said, OK, do you want to try it with the track now, Cliff? And I've sung the song through for him. And he'll press the little button to talk back and say, OK, Cliff, now, now would you like to do it the same key as the track? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I realise I've done something wrong, Suffer tune-wise. <laughs> yeah, somewhere. And he's, uh, so he was a, it was interesting to work for him because I found him very demanding in that area. So it makes you think, and I don't think that's a bad thing for us as artists. People like Mike Batt, who I did a single with, uh, funny enough, I was interested. Please don't that, fall in love. Please don't fall in love, yeah. He was very, very keen, particularly at the beginning of the song, for my enunciation to be right. We actually did, we actually made me do a line again because of the t- at the end of a word. And I, and, and I thought, is that interesting? People have these little yes. things of their own. But I, I mean, for me, I, I, I like that. Probably um, one of the easiest people to work with, Alan Tani. Because Alan, well, I mean, they have a lot in common, he, Bruce, and even Mike Bat, because they're all about sync, they're all, they're all like singers and, and songs. But Alan, uh, I never fear the mix. I was always worried about the, 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 when, they, when they mix the tracks together. Because producers can be excited about the sound of a, of a track, the, the, the singer can sometimes become just part of the sound. I never want to be like that. I don't think that I, I will ever permit one of my records to become, uh, I am the singer. I, that's all I have to offer, the track, let's face it. I don't play any of the instruments. Yes. I refuse to be pumped behind the drums. So um, I mentioned Alan because I've never, ever, if we've had to remix a track, it's because of something else. When Alan writes a song, he writes it for a singer in mind. And many times he writes it with me in mind. And when I hear the track, he has this track that pumps along. It's got multiple things in it, you know. Again, if you dissected one of Alan Tani's uh, tracks, you'd be surprised at what you can't hear. There are things in there that, you, that, that are inaudible. And yet it's what makes the track pump along, though. And, and but my voice is always floating right along the top of one of his songs. And I, and I must admit, I, I fall in, uh, on his side. I like that in songs. So all these people are the heirs to your great working relationship with Norrie Paramore. And besides Cliff and the Shadows, which um, was the act that I think he'll be most remembered for, he had an awful lot of other Columbia acts in those days. Oh, did, yes. did you ever have trouble getting his time? I mean, Never. Helen Shapiro, Frank Ifield, or no. anybody else? And what's more, I don't think any of us ever had any trouble. You know, sometimes you, when you have management, I know Norrie wasn't our manager, but he was managing our... Our recording musical. career yes, yes. Um, usually when managers have a lot of artists you'll find there's in squabbling uh, it's, it's, it's almost natural to, because some people think oh well, why is he giving him or her more time well, Town of Motown had endless problems there yes well again I, I, I don't know what it was but Norrie was um, well you know Norrie I mean, uh, Norrie was a very, very special man I will always remember him with great love and, and, and I still miss him it's really strange but uh, he had this thing that everyone was special I mean, Helen Shapiro, uh, I mean, she was the, the new young thing that came along. Why wasn't I threatened by Helen? She was the 14 or 13-year-old or whatever it was, one of the first of a, of a kind, really. You know, nowadays tennis players are that young, but singers never were that young. And so there was this great furore and up, you know, uproar about her and everything. I never felt threatened. Nuri gave me just as much time, and uh, he, he did the same for everyone. But the Shadows got as much time. I mean, they were given as much priority. And I think maybe that's what's missing now. We don't have people that nurture careers anymore. Record companies are in, are, in, are in danger of closing down, as far as I can see, because if we go on like this, having artists that make two hits and they're churned out, you know, OK, I mean, I have to contradict myself say, and say that every now and then an artist comes through that does survive five years, and if they survive five years, you, you know they're going to be around for a while. But on the whole, our industry tends to be a, a very transient thing now. No one's actually bothered. I mean, I never bothered. I don't know about you. I never bothered to learn the names of the people in the charts anymore because guaranteed if I start learning a name, they're going to be gone anyway in a couple of years. Whereas if you wait two years, you'll know the names of the people who have had three hits because they're proving themselves slowly and you become accustomed to hearing their names because their stuff is still being played. Yes. And I've, I feel that's a shame for our industry because although it's not wrong to have the injection of a, a one-hit wonder, I mean, let's face it, early rock and roll was filled with one-hit wonders, but they were the people like Nori Paramore, George Martin, and many others who actually nurtured the Helen Shapiros and the Cliff Richards and the Shadows and the Frank Ifields and, 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 and 
bolstered their their careers along all, all the way. And and we don't seem to have that so much. And I feel that that's what we're missing, if anything. Because technically and artistically, creatively, everything is still happening, I think, from the studios right here in London. Right. <laughs> of course, Norrie wasn't just your recording manager, just your A&R man, your producer. He also used to go out on the road with you. Oh, he did. Well, again, it's part of what I'm trying to say uh, about people like him. Uh, their work didn't just end at the studio. They, they, they seemed to sort of live and breathe you. I'm, I'm sure he did go home and lead a normal life, but you always got the impression that he'd been thinking about you anyway and what you were going to do next. Uh, for instance, he would be... If he wasn't actually booked as the conductor for my TV series, which I don't think he was each time, although he did do a, uh, certainly one of them, he would nevertheless come along to all the sessions that his string parts were done were, were on, and he would make sure that everyone understood what the dots meant, what the tempos were going to be... Uh, and that sort of thing went on all the time. If I did a concert, say, um, uh, what is now the, the disco in, in town, Stringfellow's Place, um, was the talk of the town. It was one of the yes. nightclubs to play. And when I played that place, he'd come along and conduct the orchestra for me. Uh, and those kind, of, those kind of things were really precious as far as I'm concerned because, again, it was confirmation that he thought that you were good and that he wanted to support you in something. He travelled all over Europe with us as conductor, uh, he came into TV shows in Europe with us, The Shadows and I, and it's the kind of it's the kind of dedication that I, th I just wish we had more of now. I just wish there were more people that could say, let's look at a video of what Nori and George Martin and others did, for people like myself, and see if we couldn't reconstruct that in some way because it should it should be uh, happening. I think. Of course, you mentioned Europe, and both you and The Shadows had enormous record success in the early days. Did you get out? all the time, if you could, out into Europe and promote? and yes, or, or, uh, or did it just happen because European radio picked up on it, Radio Luxembourg? And well, obviously what we heard was, yeah, Luxembourg was the thing that broke us almost everywhere because everybody listened to Radio Luxembourg and the, uh, the American Forces Network station as well. That was another thing we used to try and pick up. That's where I first heard Elvis' uh, Heartbreak Hotel and things. Yes. But... Uh, it, it's interesting, but we, we went out there, I suppose. It always starts with the record. You'd suddenly hear... You'd get uh, a message from Nori would say, your record's gone to number five in Germany or Holland, it's number one in Holland or something like that, you know. And so the natural progression was that we would then follow it up with a tour. And we were very fortunate in that we were there in the early days. We did some, we did some dreadful touring. I mean, people don't realise how horrific it was. We started off very early on talking about recording in mono. Well, there's an equivalent to that in concerts. And uh, we used to play halls, and uh, not even just halls, but sometimes we'd play in, uh, on the side of a riverbank in Sweden. They'd have these folk parks everywhere. You know, we used to have a joke saying, if you're not there by seven, the stage would have gone on down the, floated <laughs> down the river. We used to arrive, for instance, I remember one day driving in driving rain to the venue, the venue. And we came along, and I said, if this car turns into this field, I'm not going on tonight. And it turned into this field. Is this in well, Sweden? It was in Sweden somewhere. <laughs> and, and it turned, we drove along, and it was pouring with rain, and we saw then what looked like stands that had been built in the middle of a football pitch, and what I suppose was the stage, and it was sort of vaguely covered over, open-sided. And we went behind it, and fortunately, the two guys, uh, Sid Morris and Dave Bryce, who were, our, our, who were touring managers for us then, made us laugh. And you know what they did? We came around the corner. They must have realised that we must have been fuming at being brought to this despicable place to perform. They were wearing snorkels and flippers and, and, <laughs> and bringing us into the car park, behaving like car park attendants. So we fell about with laughter and thought, oh, OK, it's fine. And then uh, we, we went out to do that concert. And you can imagine, uh, it was pouring rain, so they'd they hired umbrellas out to the public. And there was no applause at all, because no one could applaud. They were all holding umbrellas. But in the end, it turned out to be rather a nice sight, because when the song finished, all the umbrellas went up and down. So you had this kind of <laughs> sound and all colourful umbrellas. So we've played some awful gigs, and it's, it's something that I wouldn't miss, but uh, really I'm glad I'm past. Because in those days, um, you used to re-record some of your biggest hits in the language of the... Yes. country. I mean, you would re-record in German or Italian or French. French and Spanish. And that was important, wasn't it then? Because It used to be, yes. Much more so than now. Everybody seems to record in, in English. When you think of people like ABBA and AHA, their, their first language seems to be, certainly recording language is definitely uh, English. But uh, you see, the trouble, I say the trouble, from, it was trouble because singing in German was so difficult when I first got started. I, I find it easier now. If I had to record now, it would be easier for me. But in those days, the language, I couldn't get my mouth around some of the guttural phrases 
but uh, it was it was necessary if you wanted to double your sales, and th that's what used to happen. I mean, things like Lucky Lips, uh, you'd be number one with the English version, and it would come down. They'd release the German version, and that would go over and, and take over. And if it didn't make number one, it got in the top five. And you would record phonetically if you oh, didn't yes. speak the, ling the uh, language. I I discovered years later that uh, that in fact uh, many of the lyrics I sang were really silly. I mean, I've got friends of mine that say, you know, your accent was all right, but really, that it was really rubbish what you were singing. And of course, I had no way of telling. Like, a guy used to come over from Germany and, and, and would just uh, give, give me the lyrics, and I'd write them down phonetically, and then he would just make sure my accent was right. So I believe my accent was okay. What was strange, of course, or perhaps not strange at the time, but looking back on it, was the fact that nobody, however big they were in Britain, pre-Beatles, and you were as big as you could get, really expected to have any success in America. Not only did they no. not have much success, they, they didn't expect it. No, because, again, uh, it's the fatherland of rock and roll, and so therefore they were it. And I guess we as a... Na well, everybody outside America was so affected by the Elvis phenomenon and, and all those Frankie Avalons and Fabians and Ricky Nelsons and the Jerry Lees and all the, the little Richards that it was, it, it was hard for us to... I mean, just the very fact that we even broke through any of that and became... British, the British boys, I think it's a miracle in itself. But um, no, it wasn't expected that we'd make it in the States because we were still European. And uh, it, it, it's funny because I really missed the boat in many, many ways. In 59, when I released Living Doll, it did actually get to number 30 in the States. And when we were touring there in, in the early part of 1960, I, the Shadows and I were one of three acts on the show that stopped the show every night. Was that your first trip to the States? My very first trip, yeah. It was a six-week tour, and the show was called The Biggest Show of Stars for 1960, and it was headlined by Frankie Avalon. It had Bobby Rydell, The Clovers, The Crests, The Treniers, uh, Freddie Cannon, Clyde McFatter. I mean, and I've forgotten at least another half a dozen people. We all came on did about a quarter of an hour each. None of those are that big today, one has to say. No, <laughs> but, but at that time, they were all the top of names. Of course, yes. And what happened was that I went on as an, a non-entity and an unknown, and we stopped the show every night, every single night. Myself, Bobby Rydell, and Clyde McFatter, who used to be the lead singer of the yes. Drifters. Um, and you were with the Shadows on that tour. We were, I was with the Shadows. And we three stopped the show night after night, and I thought, that's it, folks, what, what more do you need? But, you see, it was, I was too naive. You need a machinery, and at, at that particular time, they already had Elvis and the others, so what do they need another you know, British rock singer for? So I never saw my record company for the whole six weeks, and that's when, with my record at 30 in the charts. Because and the so, interesting uh, thing I find these days is that if one listens to your early stuff um, now, and if you listen to the all except the very best, like Elvis, um, uh, same era from the U.S., Yours was vastly superior, and the sound that you and the Shadows had wasn't really duplicated. Um, no, I mean, it I wasn't. mean, it was it was it was an original sound. It you was came original. Up with. I think what we lacked was their influences. You know, and what the we promotion. lacked. Yes, uh, but we needed their songs. You know, we were still struggling to find our yes. own thing. You know, th Elvis was singing all shook up, and yes. we were, we were struggling to find what's taken for granted now. I mean, some of the best songs that are the biggest hits in the world are written by. By us, by by Britons, by Europeans, by Australians. They're not all American. America doesn't have it on its own anymore. But at but that particular time, we were competing, dare I say, from an inferior standpoint. Of course, yes. Because we, we hadn't nurtured writers. The Shadows and I had hardly started writing. So all our influences were, were the Americans. And here we were trying to you know, bring ourselves to the forefront with something that was strictly American. So it was really tough. And that's why, in fact, I always feel that we were a great platform for the Beatles because... They must have seen what we were doing. They were heavily influenced. John Lennon, we know. McCartney were influenced by the Everly... I mean, the, the way the Beatles originally used to sing was the melody in the third above. That's the Everly Brothers trick. Mm. And in fact, when you first hear... If you, if you listen to Please Please Me and things, they did have a magic about them, but to me, they were inferior Don and Phil. They were not the same sound... You know, to me, Don and Phil were the best duo singers. And Paul and John were not as good initially. The thing that the th clever thing about the, the McCartney and Lennon thing was that they recognised, for instance, firstly that they couldn't make it here because of the Shads and I, and they went away. That was a brilliant move on their part. Whether it was thought out or not, I don't know, but it was brilliant because it took them away from us, and suddenly they came back with something else to offer. And again, with the Don and Phil thing, you're talking about their time in Hamburg and yes, Germany. Yes, that's right. I mean, they whatever they did there was absolutely perfectly right for them. It took them away from us, took them out of the 
competition, yes. and they came back, you know, with something else to battle with, and of course one hands down and wiped the floor with the rest of us, and didn't need to bother about whether they sang as well as Don and Phil because what they started to do was write better than almost anybody else around, and then their music changed, and 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 now. I can't even think about the Beatles and Don and Phil in, in the same way sure. because one is the Beatles and one is the Everly Brothers. And of course, the amazing thing was is that John Lennon was five or six days older than you, wasn't he? Yes, that's right. They all thought he was. My, everyone, everyone thought that the Beatles were the new boys, but of course they were the new boys, but they were just as old, just as old <laughs> as we were. You just got going first. We just. Yeah, that's right. And it's hard to believe that really, when I had my first hit record, when I was number two in the charts, I was only eighteen. I, I made my first record when I was seventeen. And that doesn't happen anymore. If you think of people like Simon Le Bon, who led off with uh, um, their band. Uh, yes, Duran Duran. Duran Duran. They were like in their early 20s. Yes. Well, it's, it's become much more of an adult career. Although still aimed at young people. Yes. Strange, and it, isn't but it? It's, but it's also, in, in, in a strange way, even though one always has the way out rebels and people getting into trouble with various things, it's, it's, it's much more respectable. It's almost like if a, if a son says to his father, now, Dad, I'm going to be an accountant. He goes, oh, terrible. Couldn't, yeah. you, couldn't you please be a rock star? You <laughs> yes. know, do something with, with, with great potential or possibilities. I think, um, I think that rock and roll, uh, I mean, I, I sometimes feel I'm, a, I'm alone in believing this, but I do believe it's an art form. Uh, I, there's a piece of graffiti I hate which says, it's only rock and roll. And I think, what a put down for what is now. When you think that we don't ask for subsidies and grants, uh, all we do is sell out 15,000 seater stadiums because they don't build... They don't build rock and roll places for us, so you have to go and find wherever you can. They build, they build uh, uh, opera houses, and um, but nothing to cater for people like us. And yet, I think that we, 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 in fact, in terms of the musical industry in its widest sense, we're the ones that keep it churning round and round all the time. There are constantly new bands, constantly new singers, constantly new, new records, and constantly records being broken. So I have, I, I feel very strongly about it being an art form, and that's probably why, as you say. In many, many respects, it's quite a respectable thing to chase after. Um, and again, and people who don't last, of course, it's quite often their own fault. When I say fault, it's perhaps because they don't want it to last, you know, you, because their attitudes, they just want to have a fun now and move on to something else. Yes, I think one of the key factors, other than talent, is a, a, a sort of huge determination to keep going. And well, if you lose that, you might as well get out because your work will suffer. If you like presenting music on stage, if you like performing in lights and creating images for people, then you've got to be in the theatre. You know, I, I say rock and roll is part of the theatre now. That, that's where you need to be. And if you are an artist, then that's, how can you ever want to be anything else? And that's why I say some people, it's their own attitude that in fact takes them away, because it, there's nothing wrong with their immediate talent. When you, you don't have a hit record by accident. You know, it has something to offer. It's only if you do it five times, you then know that this was not a fluke and that you have something else to offer, that you can take your public somewhere else. The chances of you taking someone else's public somewhere else are nil. I've re I recognise that over the years. Mm. I'm not going to move a die-hard Rolling Stone fan anywhere at all, nowhere at all. He might be able to put up with me, but I'm not going to take him anywhere. But I can take my fans to a lot of different places, and that's all any artist ever does, whether they be an actor or a singer or a dancer even. When you... Um, recorded I'm Nearly Famous, the album, in 76, I believe yes. I'm right in saying, which included Devil Woman. I, I think I'm right, am I? Yes, it, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Panicking here. Tim, you're never this. wrong about <laughs> <Yes>. these things. <laughs> but Devil Woman, really, um, which followed Miss Unites, which I think is perhaps still my favourite of all your recordings. But Devil Woman, which is another magnificent record, that was the one that really broke you in the States. Yes. I mean, you, as you said, you had that reasonable success and a huge success for the time with Living Doll back in 1960. But here we are, you're almost 20 years into your hugely successful European career and mm. suddenly you're in the American top five. How did that feel? It felt fantastic because again, at least I can say I cracked the singles market in the fatherland of rock and roll. Uh, but you see, I don't think I've actually cracked it because you, you know what it's like over there, well everybody does now. With America, if you don't have an album you know, correspondingly in the album charts, as your single is, if you're if you're in the top five in the single charts, normally it's to be expected that you'll have a top ten album. And when you bring out your second single, that will push the album up. If the second single is a success, success then you're almost certainly going to have a top five album. Well, I've never ma managed to do that. And for years I thought, well, this is just an absolute mystery. How can I have 
as I have had nine top 30 hit singles and no albums in the top 50. It's not possible. My record company started off by telling me, you give us the singles, you come over here and work the single, we will give you the album. So I say, okay, you didn't give me the album. I gave you nine singles. And you know what? I, I have to go. When I have a single release there, if I'm serious, I have to go there and talk to thousands of radio stations. I have to do all these terrible plug uh, TV shows. And it's not exactly very exciting, I have to say. It's not the most exciting thing I, I do in my life. But I did it. And nine times I got the single. But I never got the album. So although I cracked it, it's a hairline crack. <laughs> and I've never been able to prize it open further and, and become uh, known in the same way as I'm known in Britain. Whereas, you see, I feel that I still desperately want to perform there. I've done... I've done concert tours there, and I've received terrific accolades. I mean, I did the my, one of my ambitions was to play the Greek theatre. I always heard about the Greek, and Olivia played it. And, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, and Neil Diamond played it. And it always sounds so romantic, open air, amphitheatre and stuff. And my ambition, I fulfilled it. I played it, and we sold out in Los Angeles. And I got a review that was so amazing. I could never... I mean, I wouldn't... If I had to write it myself, I, I would have laid off on some of the stuff. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Even if I thought it. You yes. Know. But I just took it to my record company and I threw it on the table. I said, well, I can't do any more, you know, guys. This is, this is my work. I, I perform this. I sell myself and the records. And now you've got to just get the albums out there. And nothing ever happened. So, you know, EMI and I have a great understanding. In almost every other part of the world, we've had a terrific, terrific success. In the one area that sells more records than any, any other individual territory in the world I have had no success whatsoever and so uh, but I'm not I'm not embittered so I do have to be philosophical about America in general and say that perhaps it's never meant to, to be for me now I, I guess it may never happen for me now not in that in that big manner but obviously you have things in life that are infinitely more important to you than the American oh, charts yeah, of so um oh yes absolutely yeah that's why in fact it's easier for me to face it I always feel my Christianity has always been a massive help to me because I've always thought what would I have felt like if if really all I had was the music I played I not having America would have made me I think really really hardened because I'd have, I think I'd have got really quite stroppy with the company too and probably uh, well I've been given a figure which better. shows that you're Combined album and single sales up until the 1st of September 1989, and you've had a few hits since then, were over 215 million units. So I shudder to think if you had had success in if America. In the States, yes. <laughs> well, I guess there's no point in me being You're doing all about right. It. Yes, I know. Well, it's not that aspect of it that, that my ambition was running to. I mean, I know, yes, you're right. Of course, I can't grumble about the, the success rate that I've had and the amount of success I've had. It's been phenomenal. Even, I mean, even I can see that about myself. Usually you read it about other people. But, but America wasn't something I needed financially or anything. It was because, you know, I am what I am because of Elvis. And therefore, I have to say that's because of the American culture, the musical culture that led to Elvis becoming what he was and creating a, an avenue for all of us that became rock singers to go down. And so therefore, I'd like to have been acceptable in, in, in that area. Now, mentioning Elvis ties in, I think, in a funny way, perhaps, with your mentioned just now of Christianity, which obviously has been a guiding force in your life for a long time now. And Elvis also had this religious um, streak in him. I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm it's kind of church, from a church background. Yes, yes, and yet poor Elvis's life ended up tragically. And yeah. you've, you've been able to cope with it. And I would guess, and in fact I know, that, that, that your Christian work and your Christian life has kept you sane. I believe so, Tim. I mean, I... It's hard to think about Elvis without feeling a great lump because you think, oh, you know, my throat always gets constricted. You, you had a man who gave s pleasure to countless thousands of people. I mean, and, pr and presented the world with rock, the rock and roll form as we kind of know it and came to love it and accept it. And yet he died as probably one of the most unhappy people. He was grossly overweight uh, and almost certainly was overdrugged. I mean, died of an overdose and heart giving out and all this. And you think to yourself, how... It's life is so unfair when Elvis gave so much and seemed to re get so little. And I have a love-hate relationship with his fans because I think that although he was the most successful man uh, creatively and musically speaking, he's one of the most unsuccessful men that I can think of. You know, he, did ne he never got his life together after his mother died. Apparently his mother had a great influence upon him and she was kind of the, the restraining factor, constrained him in many, many ways. But when she died, he apparently went off the rails a little. And I think that if I have had any sanity, yes, I put it down to the fact that I, that I am a Christian, 
that that Jesus is the restraining factor in, in everything that I ever do. Apart from him, apart from the spiritual aspect of my life, I have been fortunate enough to have, and we've already talked about Nori Paramore, there have been others in my life. My friends and the people that work around me are sane people. They're not, they don't play games with this business that I'm in. A lot of people that I meet, you must meet them too, you feel, this is all a big game, you know. Their contracts are just full of stupid riders, like we, are, we want smarties in the, in the dressing room, but all the brown ones taken out. Well, I mean, this is all silly games. Well, we've never done that. And I've always been surrounded by people who have a certain amount of sanity themselves. So I can't take all the credit myself. And I feel that Elvis maybe was never really loved. And it's no good the fans writing to me and saying, well, we loved him. Of course we loved him. But our love doesn't touch him. It reaches him, but it doesn't really touch him. And so, um, you know, you need to be loved and cared for by people who can touch you, see you, blow raspberries at you if they think you're doing something silly. That's what love is. Criticism is the best when it's given with love. So we as fans loved him. And although, our, well, our, obviously, he knew we loved him, so therefore it reached him. It, it, it never touched his life. And I've got a feeling that uh, there's a lot to be answered for. People like Colonel Tom Parker will have a lot to answer for because uh, there seem to have been no helpful, loving discipline, dare I say? Yes, well, he was surrounded, one felt, by sycophants yes. who would do anything to keep him from reality. Yeah. And he got to the point where he couldn't walk into a supermarket or do anything. That's I mean, right. I know you have a pretty normal life. You oh, have to, I, I do my own know, shopping. Exactly. I, I don't mind wheeling that trolley around at all. I, to, to me, it's really important anyway that in the only locality I can be normal, I take the step of being normal. Yes. Because otherwise, you know, when you're on tour, of course you don't expect to be able to walk around a supermarket freely because everyone knows you're in town. They've seen the posters up. And so therefore I have to live that life while I'm, say, on tour. But when I'm at home, it's it's although, of course, I get recognized where I live, I want it to be a different type of recognition. I like it when the butcher thumbs up and goes, all right, mate, yes. you know, and, <laughs> and just waves as you walk by. To me, that's not, that's what he does with others who he knows that walks by. So um, it's been a very important factor in my life to have that aspect of my life clear of what I would call the showbiz hype thing, which I'm quite happy to be part of at other times. That's part of my job. Because in the last eight, nine years, pop music, rock music and charity, good causes, has become almost big business. Yes. And uh, there's certainly some people have made criticisms of one or two of the approaches to charity that... Well, it's good Music that criticism can be made to it. I but mean, do, you, do you feel totally at ease about all these charitable projects, or do you think sometimes that people might be now using them almost to get into the charts? I find it difficult to criticise it, because I, I feel, I'm a, I feel I think I'm a pragmatist, because there is a problem in the world, massive, massive problem. There is a lot of money around, and we need to collect it and inject it from one to another. And so therefore, for me, sometimes why someone might appear on a Live Aid, Band Aid, Lemonade program, it doesn't really matter as far as I'm concerned, as, as long as that end result means that money will go to help someone. I would, to me, it's much nicer. For me, my motivation, the reason why I, I don't do massive great charitable things is because I think the personal side of it counts as well. So that when I go on my little tiny tours that really nobody knows about, except now they do, I'm telling them on the CD. <laughs> but we only played about 2,000 people, but it's not just me doing it. There's usually been a committee of local Christians who have written, and I've said, yes, I'll come, but you organize it. So they organize it, they do, all the, they do deal with the press locally, they sell the tickets, and I come and do the show. So it's somebody else's gig as well. And I feel that that makes it possible for us to go on and on and on doing it. If your motivation is wrong and you do one, the chances are you won't do another one. People will still die, you'll become famous, and you won't do any more. Whereas uh, it, it's so easy, it doesn't take much, you know, to, uh, it doesn't cost me a great deal. It costs me nothing to do these things at all. And I've often thought, I wish we could form a group of us. In fact, I've talked with a couple of people. In fact, I was talking with some of the status quo uh, the other day, uh, Francis Rossi and, and Rick Parfit. And we were talking about this, saying, wouldn't it be fantastic if we started like a consortium of rock stars? And we all decided, and it wouldn't take more than this, no demands. You'd only be in that consortium if you wanted to be. We all decided that every tour we do, any, any concert beyond 20 that we do, we give to uh, our char this charity. And it would cost us nothing. And therefore, it would mean that if, if the Springsteen was playing to 100,000 people a night for 21 nights, there'd be one concert of 100,000 people, and that money would go. He wouldn't miss it. Crumbs, you know. That, not sure. Not at all. Uh, it's, it would be perfect. It would be a wonderful way to do it. But we'd need to want to do it. I, I would only want to be part of that if the others wanted to do it. I, I don't want to be part of 
of, uh, of giving for the sake of giving just to make us feel good. Yes, I think you're dead right. I think there's a danger in some of these charities um, that people have the feeling that if I throw money at it, the problem will go, go away, away, and that's all I need to do. No. But that's, that's often not the case. And, it's not. And, and you've got to give your time, and your interest is, is often much more important. And I often feel that people listening to us now, for instance, uh, mustn't be intimidated by the fact that, say, Live Aid, in one foul swoop, got 50 million. It's the pennies that count. I, I, I quote a man who I heard say once, he said, one man cannot change the world but you can change the world for one man. And that put everything in perspective. I thought to myself, well, yeah, I can do, I can do. My, my gardener said to me, we're trying to raise 830 pounds for this electric chair for this kid in our locality. Would you come down with your, to the British Legion Club with your guitar? I went down, it got, took me half an hour, and we raised 850 quid. That's peanuts. It's a drop in the bucket. But it's changed the world for that little kid. And At least not, you not know. Me. I mean, the, you, you are absolutely certain that that 850 quid you got value from every single penny. Yes, and, and everyone there had a part to play in it, and it was an important part, because if they hadn't come and supported me singing my Living Dolls on guitar, the kid would still be without his wheelchair. And and that's what I, I feel, that's the importance of it, so that the individual who actually supports uh, mustn't be uh, blown away by the fact that, yes, it takes the geld off to do it, but even he can't do it unless the millions of individuals are prepared sure. f- because of compassion. I always feel that's the area as well, the individual, uh, the motivation of the individual is important for the individual, not for the cause. Because if, if, if 10 million people all give 10 million pounds, it'll be a lot of money. But if they give it in bad grace, I'd almost be tempted to say, oh, don't bother me. Cliff, how do you feel about the next 10 years of, or the next 30 years of your career, or the next 50 <laughs> years of your career? Tim, I, I never, ever looked this far ahead when I first got started. I mean, I, because I guess people like myself were, uh, were, Pioneers, no one knew. It, when I got started, Elvis had only been going for about three or four years anyway. Or was it four or five years? I can't remember. But whatever Less it was. Less than that, no. But not much more than two and a half, three, was really. It? Well, in England, anyway. Certainly, therefore, none of us knew whether a rock and roll singer, quote unquote, could actually survive any, any amount of time at all. And it wasn't until five, ten, fifteen years went by that suddenly I thought, oh, wait a minute. Now we're talking longevity. It's within our grasp. Yeah, so I, you aren't probably not going to have to get a job. I'm certainly not going to have to get a job. <laughs> or a no. different job, rather. <laughs> not a different one, no. But in terms of looking ahead, I, I would never have dreamt that a man of 50 would have been singing rock and roll. But there again, but that's because nobody at 50 was singing rock and roll. 50-year-old people in 1956 were into jazz bands and Frank Sinatra and Perry Comer. They were not into Elvis. My aunts, aunts and uncles didn't like Jerry Lee Lewis and Little Richard. But now, here I am. I'm an uncle. I've got ten nephews and nieces, and I still think that pop rock is great, and I like many of the records that they like. Not all of them, but that's life, isn't it? Yes. And so, therefore, I look ahead thinking, well, all I have to do is be true to myself and, and do what I like to do and be uh, uh, loyal to my public and, and cater for their needs, then, and I can't see it stopping, really, unless I make some drastic mistakes. Do you think you'll get back um, into musical theatre after time, for example, would you, would, you like, would you like to do another show? I thought your yes. last live show was the first half when you recreated the 50s. Yes. I mean, that was that was very theatrical. It was theatrical, yes. Someone actually said to me it was like going to a musical. And I thought, oh, whoopee, that's really great. Cause it, I wanted it was to. great. It was, it was a, well, a superb recreation of that era. Well, we tried hard to make it. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying because, in fact, some of the band and I are old enough to remember the era, but the twelve dancers, none of them. I mean, they were all no nobody among, on that stage dancing with me was um, more than twenty five years old, so they had no idea of that particular period of time, and so therefore a, a lot has to be said for their creativity. They were able to sort of suck it all in and 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 present it outwards. But um, I would like to do another musical. I have to say, I'm just waiting for. It took me a long time before I decided I'd do time. It suited me really well. I can't see myself in a Phantom of the Opera type musical, and uh, I need I need to be comfortable with what I'm going to do. And in time, I felt really comfortable. I played the part of a rock and roll singer, which I kind of know something about. <laughs> and, and the music was the songs were sort of average to good. I don't think we had a great song, although I did like "It's in Every One of Us" as a song. I did think it was a wonderful anthem, which is how we used it in the show. And there was she, "She's So Beautiful," which was a, a good pop song. Yeah. And the rest were average to good pop songs. So I'm looking now to doing something that perhaps has less music in it, more spoken word, and maybe an, an album's worth of music. I'd like to go back to the way they used to do things like 
carousel in Oklahoma where there was almost more spoken word than there was sung. And in that way, I, I, I have this vision of me doing uh, a musical that is filled with songs of the quality of Miss Unites and Devil Woman. Yes, that was a problem when I saw Time, which I enjoyed very much and thought it was great, you know, from your point of view. The, and it was superbly staged, great effects and everything. But because, as you say, and I cannot disagree with you, the score wasn't phenomenally strong no. the whole way through. I kept thinking, there's this Britain's greatest rock and roller up there. Why can't he do Miss Unites or yes. Devil Woman? That's <laughs> you know? right. I know. It was a little frustrating. You kept thinking, oh, well, this is this is a very nice song and it's yes. fine, but I don't really know it and I'd rather hear no. him do Living Doll. And that's right. And of course, and what you've got to do is uh, you have to assess something on first I think hearing. it was a little bit too close. I mean, obviously, it was, it, was, it was very good for your first major West End musical. It was probably a very sensible move, but I think it was because it was rather close to your real life persona. Yes. We kind of thought, well, let's have your real let's life hits. Yes, that would have been actually would have been a good way of doing it, of course. <laughs> but there again, I, I had no control on anything on that. Uh, it was a no. And, listen, it was a huge success. It ran for oh, yeah, fine. however I mean, long it was. I had seven hundred fifty thousand people come and see me when I did it. I did it for the first year. So yes, it was a success in that respect. But, it, but we can never sit back on our successes because you know there's always that step more to do. There's always that other step to take. And I still believe that. Um, I mean, I think that. If I do one again, and it's possible, I mean, I'd like to think maybe two years ahead that I might be involved in something. I didn't even talk about it because there are four other people trying to get the same kind of thing on the on the road. I'm hoping that one of them will, will, will do it and fail. Because <laughs> if they <laughs> fail, I'll come up with my idea. But I still think that it's possible to do a, 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 a theatrical West End presentation with rock and roll Basic rock and roll. And I say rock and roll in the widest sense of its word. Nowadays, people say to me, you're not a rock and roll singer, are you? And I think to myself, well, what are they looking at? What, yes. what do they see in me? Do I sing classics? No. Do I sing jazz? No. Do I sing country? No. What's left is rock and roll. Because we've dissected it all down and made it rock and heavy rock and lead rock or whatever it is, that, that, all it does is tell us that, that this piece of rock and roll has a different emphasis. If you talk about heavy metal, you know that it's loud, raucous guitars, usually four-piece combo, and a guy that sings in a, in a very, usually a very high register. But it's still rock and roll. And when I do Devil Woman, it's just as rock and roll, it just has a different emphasis. Now, I believe that a rock and roll musical can, can be staged where you have high drama, and when you can't speak it anymore, the character must sing it. And when he's sung it, you forget it and go on to the next piece of high drama. Now, that's my dream. Now, I do believe it's possible, and with the help of... Um, I believe a very talented man. I'm hoping that I'll be able to pull it off. But I've heard through the grapevine that others have got the same theory in mind, the same theme in mind, and I'm, I'm waiting to see whether they come up with a success. Well, I've found in my experience of theatre, whatever idea you have, somebody else has always got it. Um, it's, 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 and it doesn't actually matter. It usually means that it's quite a good idea. No, well, I suppose if someone and else did room, it first... And in a way, there was always room for two. Um, yes, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be adverse to it. If someone did it and it was a massive success... Then you might have a problem. I would then, well, then I would think to myself, well, why bother competing with yes. that? If it's that, even if you think yours is better, uh, but uh, if it if it falls into the same, in fact, I've heard I, I'm, one of the groups approached me to be in this production, and I've said no because again, I find it it falls into the same category as as the traditional musical, whereas I'd rather, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we've we talked about. You know, you never get rid of Shakespeare. There's lots of things you won't get rid of. You never get rid of Cliff and the Shadows and part, as part of history. And you won't get rid of traditional musicals. And who wants to? There, It's a pleasurable thing to go to. For me doing it, though, I still want... No one has started the rock and roll musical. I mean, you and Andrew uh, touched on it when you did your... Um, superstar. The, the Superstar and the Dreamcoats. You know, you, but it's kind of stopped there. Yes, no I, one else I, has really done anything like that. Yes, I mean, this is obviously not for the record, but... With with chess, we tried to do it, and it's and, chess, and I have to admit. it's it's interesting. You should leave this on the record. I think chess was one of the best things going in town because again, I could relate to the music perfectly. I thought the music was fantastic. I went there and I heard a lot of fabulous songs. But in America, funnily enough, we got criticised heavily by the key critic, the one who matters, by saying, "This is nothing more than three hours rock and roll." And I thought, well, that's a compliment, it's but a, that was death yeah. for the Broadway audiences. But then again, we, but then we're going to have to fight through that. Yes. It's because the, if, if there's a concept, it, if there's a, pr a preconception of what you're supposed to be doing, then theatre stays with Shakespeare. Fortunately, theatre itself smashed that up. People do all sorts of avant-garde things, and it's still accepted as theatre. In the same way, musicals must not be trapped to what some 
critic thinks is a musical. Exactly. Anything that's music that's injected into a story must be termed as musical. It's a bit like trying to describe what is rock, heavy rock, pop. Yes. We're, we're trapped in titles again, and some people still think that, th that they've got to call something by one item, by one word only, and that's it, I'm afraid. Well, just to conclude, Cliff, you should be congratulated on having your 100th British hit. Thank you. Of having your 1,000th week on the British charts. <laughs> I'm sure these figures have been more or less duplicated all over the world, but I haven't got the facts I do to like hand. hearing them, though. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and just to let you know that if you keep on having hits at the rate you are having them in England, you will overhaul Elvis Presley, your first great hero, by the year 1997. Oh, and right. I would like to come back and talk to you again at, on that occasion. It's a deal. <laughs> it's a deal. I'll try hard anyway. Great. Great.